Thank you for, um, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Lovely to see such a big group of people all interested in access and heritage, cultural heritage. Um, so where do I come from? This is the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision. It's quite a remarkable building outside Amsterdam. And the actual, it's a cultural heritage institution. It was founded in 1997, and it was the merger of uh, three archives and one museum. The archives were the Broadcast Archive, the Film and Science Archive, and the National Government Information Archive. Um, and effectively, that's still what and who we are. We are still an archive and a museum. Uh, this is the building inside. What you see downstairs, these five floors down, I go deep down, that's the actual archive with all the vaults where all the films are, the audio tapes, uh, the objects and so on, but also the digital archive, which is becoming increasingly important. And um, above that, in the top left, that's where the museum is, and we have about 15 uh, very interactive pavilions with lots of touch screens and things for adults, older people, um, but also a lot for kids. People that seem to have fun. We have about 250,000 museum visitors a year who actually pay a ticket to get in. Um, which, and that's outside Amsterdam, so that's quite an achievement because it's very difficult to get people outside the capital. Um, this is where we're sort of located, and it's sort of, it also sums up the mission that we have. We are located just outside Amsterdam, 30 kilometers, in the so-called Hilversum Media Park. As you see, Google, uh, we're the only building that Google didn't squeeze. Uh, we're the only three-dimensional building left. The rest is not really worth looking at anyway. So, but it's the, but what we were surrounded by broadcasters. We were surrounded by people who actually produce the content, who produce the media. And we are the archive and the museum for them to show all the content. So it's quite a, it's quite a great position to be in, but it also... Um, it also makes our task very difficult. We have very demanding users of the archive. They are broadcast professionals. They want it now. They need it now. You can't tell them to come back next week because we can't find it. We need to act immediately. So we've, we were a very production-oriented archive. We have a huge collection, um, dating back from 1896. And the collection is... Um, the central position of the actual institute, because content is key, and I think we should all agree to that. Um, we hold about 80% of the Dutch audiovisual heritage. That's more than 850,000 hours of audiovisual material, film, video, audio, um, but also 2 million photographs, 20,000 objects, and the collection is still growing. Of that collection, 700,000 hours are digital have been digitized. And it's all in one catalog, apart from the objects. I sh I'm a bit lying here, but well, 1.2 catalogs. In total, it's 10.3 petabyte. A petabyte is a thousandth terabyte. And the identical figure for the backup in a different location, obviously. So it's quite a big archive. So how, do we, how did we get such a big amount of uh, digital content. Well, a lot of it is born digital. D D Dutch broadcasters uh, switched to born digital content in 2006 already. So that means 8,000 hours of TV, so that's tapeless, 54,000 hours of radio, and 1,500 hours of various other sources, documentary makers, creative industry, people who just come to our archives to to deposit the material. There's no legal deposit in the Netherlands, so we're not in the lucky position that Norway's in. Um, but they seem to find us. And then there was the Images for the Future project, Bilden voor de Toekomst, um, where we digitized, well, the numbers you can see, enormous amounts of uh, material, and we did that in seven years' time. Maybe it's nice to just show a short video of what the project, uh, the program, that lasted, that went from 2007 till 2014 was about. It's in Dutch, but it's got English subtitles, so I hope you can follow it. De afgelopen eeuw was de eerste in de geschiedenis waarin we ons leven in beeld en geluid konden vastleggen. Tienduizenden films, honderdduizenden video's en miljoenen foto's liggen opgeslagen in archieven 
waar de tijd letterlijk aan de prachtige beelden en geluiden vreet. Beelden voor de toekomst geeft het materiaal een nieuw leven. Het is van ons allemaal en iedereen zou er eenvoudig bij moeten kunnen. Maar hoe regel je dat als alles weggestopt in archieven ligt? Het antwoord is... Digitaliseren. Digitale bestanden breng je immers veel gemakkelijker naar bijvoorbeeld huiskamers, schoolklassen of de creatieve industrie. Je kunt met het materiaal remixen, nieuw werk maken of informatie verrijken. Alle items krijgen slimme labels en beschrijvingen, zodat je snel het juiste fragment of die ene foto kunt vinden. Elke dag komt er meer materiaal beschikbaar. Elke dag kunnen er meer mensen van genieten. Beelden voor de toekomst. Voor een duurzaam en open audiovisueel erfgoed. Dank je. It's good to mention that uh, what you saw in the end, that there's, there was two more consortium, uh, three more consortium partners. That was two collection holding um, institutions. That's the Netherlands Film Institute, currently called I, and the National Archive as well. And Kenis Lund, who basically helped us with the communication and also is responsible for this little film, uh, which is very enjoyable and made a, big of it, made a lot of impact uh, with Dutch um, policy makers, as you can imagine. Um, because basically that's what we did. We lobbied to get this money. Na Holland has a lot of natural gas reserves. Um, what they normally do, they use these, the money that comes out of that to um, spend it on infrastructure, on building bridges, dikes, and so on. Because there is a business case. You know, people can go back, go to work quicker. They can, they can, they, they, you know, they save time, so you save money, there is a business case. So they say, okay, we give you the money to build this bridge. What we did, we actually lobbied for to get that money and say there is a business case to digitize audiovisual heritage. So what they did, they gave us more than 173 million euros to spend in seven years. We had to digitize, but also make it accessible because we said by making it accessible, that's the business case. That's where we get the money back by getting the money out of there, um, get, getting the content out there. So we started in 2007, we got the money, so we had to approximately earn about 60 million euros out of this digitization. So we needed to start digitizing, because that's the first step. We called it the 2007, there was a triangle of challenges, we called it. And that was just, you know, the three constraints you're in, there is time, there's cost, there is the source material, and so on. So we split it up in two work groups. One group was um, working on digitization, which is sort of the top cloud. We had to think about permanence, storage, coding, resolutions, and so on. And a second group uh, was, uh, started thinking about accessibility, retrieval, reuse, and so on, because we needed to get that money back to the government. Um, so, you know, as in Holland, we sit in little circles, we decide on what we do. This is just an example of what we chose, um, which formats we chose uh, to use. Um, this is, was also a nice little brainstorm session on resolutions. We just plotted different sub-collections from our archive on um, importance and cinematographical and technical quality. Well, you can imagine the discussions were ridiculous. It lasted for a long time, but we plotted this. And so we decided on HD as the 2K. Um, quite pragmatic, actually. We set up a couple of own digitization projects ourselves because we believe it's very important to actually keep knowledge of, digitiz of digitizing uh, analog carriers within the actual institute because we're the only ones left apart from I, but they're mainly focused on film. Some lessons learned from the digitization um, is that we didn't really know that much about our collection. <laughs> um, metadata is super important because we need to, uh, but also knowing what the carriers are because we are all in Europe, most of us, so we work, we have to tender, Europe, we have to put out European bids, tenders, to get uh, to work with suppliers to, to help us digitize this material. So you need to know what you are giving to them. Well, that was a big lesson learned. These slides will be up, so I'm sure you will be able to see them, but the outsourcing bit is quite important. Do some digitizing yourself as well, because it's really important to keep that knowledge 
within the um, institutes. Then the formats. Um, that's actually where access comes in. Um, we were quite pragmatic. We believe that the context in which you want to make uh, material accessible justifies certain the, the choice for formats that you make. They may not be standard. They may not be the ones that are recommended by international bodies. And I know I'm not saying a very popular thing, but it actually justifies different choices. That's what we found out. That's, the, uh, that's what I can give you. But this is just some lessons that we learned from digitizing, from the digitization process. But you remember there was the other working group that needed to earn money with the content. So what do we do with it? We have it digitized, we provide access. Um, we have started within the consortium of the three partners, we started so many platforms. Um, at one stage, I think we had about 73 or something URLs, which was, it was getting a bit ridiculous. This was 2007. We thought as a cultural heritage institute that we needed to send, you know, we needed to tell the world what our collection was about. We needed to, you know, so we created a URL, a thematic URL, and we thought people would come to us. Big mistake. Of course, the whole thing, we didn't earn that money. In 2010, we started realizing that we were not going to earn that much money. YouTube had, by that time, become quite, in, become quite big. People were just not expecting to pay for, for money. Even 31%, which I heard from Guido, is not a lot. And people weren't paying a lot. And this operation cost 173 million euros. You're never going to earn that back with cultural heritage. So the government <laughs> wasn't that pleased. So just as in Jerry Maguire, and the show me the money, well, we didn't have much to show. So what we renegotiated the uh, actual program, and um, we basically the obligation to earn the money back, they withdrew that, but they also cut the digitization budget by 37 million, which is in the middle of a program. So we already had a lot of choices were made, a lot of uh, digitization projects had been started, so that was quite a big shock to the program, as you can imagine. But it was a realistic one, because I'm not saying I don't, because it's basically a very big lesson we learned and it's also very important for policymakers to actually realize that it will always cost us more to digitize and to preserve our heritage than it will generate money. It will always cost more. We should, it, it's part of a public mission that we have. We don't have big brands very often that we have. You know, it's, it's part of our public mission. We need to preserve this content. We need to digitize it, get it out there as much as possible, be in touch with users but don't expect to become rich. Don't expect to cover the costs of your, um, of your operation. I'm not, I'm not having an argument here against cultural entrepreneurship, you know, because that's something that's really big. We need to be entrepreneurs. We do, we do need to be entrepreneurs, but our business case can very often be immaterial. It can't, it's not a material business case. There's no financial business case in this case. And policymakers and politicians should really start understanding that. And we shouldn't feed them this information either, because very often cultural heritage institutions do that. We are in a game of the attention economy. For example, here we have a little guesstimate of, what, uh, of the material that we have in our... Um, um, there's a, the little, gr little blue, green, I can't even see it. What do you see? Well, the little dot in the bottom right corner is the hours of content that's used in the new content produced by broadcasters. So broadcasters use our material, um, our collection, to use this. It's a tiny little percentage. If you then look at the total collection of Sound and Vision, here it says 750, that's actually a typo, it's 850. You see that little dot has become even smaller. To become relevant, we are in an attention game. <laughs> um, cultural heritage institutions, that we have a public mission to show the material. Our mission, for example, says that we want people to, re to create, to learn with, 
to experience cultural heritage and the information it contains. But to do that, we basically, we need different channels. We need to think differently. Uh, you can't just put your catalog online. Um, you can't just create a couple of URLs. It's not going to work. So what we basically come up with is the next three little lessons. We basically need more of this. It's a very simple. Uh, it's just three little words, smart, connected, and open. And that's basically been drive, uh, driving our strategy uh, at Sound and Vision when it comes to access. Smart means you just have to engage, um, you, you just have to start working with very, um, with um, technology that improves retrieval. Uh, you have to become part of the semantic web. Um, for example, our thesaurus is part of the, of the semantic web. Um, it's an open, it's an open, uh, it's an open scores. Everyone can use it, and basically now we're promoting other cultural heritage institutions within the Netherlands to also use it. So that you can already see the advantages of that. And also commercial companies start getting interested in this because it means that their um, online visibility is also increasing. You need to be connected, connected to the users. Um, I love the example of Wikipedians in residence. We have actually the activities and the things that a Wikipedian in residence does, we have included that compulsory in all the new uh, job descriptions that take effect on the 1st of January 2015 at Sound and Vision. Um, it may sound weird, so basically next year we don't have one Wikipedian in residence, we have about 25. They won't all be doing this, they won't all be doing this full time, but it is really an important step to take. So you have to be connected to your users. Use the wisdom of the crowd. The crowd is a lot wiser than all of us together. There's more people, people know more about our collections outside our institution than the people at the institution. You know, it's just a, we have to be humble about this, but this is really true. Stay connected to, to the actual industries that you work with, the context, the, the, the broadcasters, uh, what do they do, the creative industries, connect to their workflows to maximize the impact of your, um, of your digitized uh, heritage. And then finally, be open. Dare to be open. That's also something, you know, you have, I think we, we need to be a bit braver uh, as cultural heritage institutions. Don't be so, um, if you've tried to find who's the right holder and you can't find it, get the material out there. You know, what's the worst that can happen? I know there's some people who <laughs> would really disagree with me, but I think it's, 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 it's part of our mission. We have to do it. Use open, um, use open uh, licenses. All the materials that we have the rights of, without any exception, we put under a Creative Commons license. Because we truly believe that that's the way forward. Also, we use open source code standards. For example, the thesaurus we're using. Everyone can use it. Everyone can access it. If you have a, if you have a list of bird names that, like a nature institution, that can be included in our thesaurus. And it can enrich the material that you, that other institutions have, that other people have. So that's basically what I wanted to say. And I think this, these lessons that we've learned from this huge digitization project and the understanding that instead of trying to earn money with your content, which you can still do, I mean, because we adopt this strategy, our, the money that we generate by the, uh, repurposing the material has actually tripled. But that was not the main aim. It's just a sort of a side effect, collateral luck to this whole project. But this is because of, we did this. So thank you.